Hallelujah. Anybody got an appetite? Is anybody hungry? Is anybody thirsty? Scripture says, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? You're going to get filled. Amen? Turn around look at somebody say, you're going to get filled. If you're hungry. If you're thirsty. And you know the first sign of sickness is you lose your appetite. So if you're not hungry for God this morning... You need to start going to Dr. Jesus, and you need to get a checkup and a physical and find out what's wrong. Amen? Because something's wrong. And I just want to set the record straight. Gary Nangle was 17 years old when I was born. (laughs) Just saying. She said that like I was older than him. Did you hear her? Jamie, where are you at? You're fired. I don't know what you do, but you're... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Me and Gary, we have an ongoing joke, and Gary says, well, at least you do, right? (laughs) Amen. That's good. That's good. Hallelujah. Well, this morning is Communion Sunday, and uh, if you did not receive a communion article, then uh, we want to get you one. If you lift your hand, the ushers will wait upon you, and I'm going to take a moment here and share a few things from the Word, because... It is very, very, very important that you understand what you're about to do. Amen? You're about to retell the story. Amen? And when you retell the story, especially when it comes to God, you want to get the story right. Can you say amen? All right. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 of this morning is where we're going to start. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup... You are retelling the story, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Now, that's pretty serious. Amen? That's pretty serious. And here's what Paul says next. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in the wrong spirit, in the King James it says, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of dishonoring the body and the blood of the Lord. So what do we do? Here's what he said. Let each individual first evaluate his own attitude, and only then, only then, eat the bread and drink the cup. For continually eating and drinking with the wrong spirit will bring judgment upon yourself by not recognizing the body. This insensitivity is why many of you are weak, chronically ill, wow, and some are even dying. That's serious. Is there anything more serious in this room this morning than dying? That's very serious. But that's the stakes for what we're about to do. I grew up in church and I was never warned. I grew up in church and I was never taught this. I took communion as a young man and was never taught while living in sin with a wrong spirit. Here I was drinking a cup of judgment instead of a cup of salvation. Because I was dishonoring the Lord with my life. I confessed him with my mouth and I denied him with my life. Amen? So here's the moral of this. He goes on to say, but when we are, um, if you do not sit in judgment of others, you will avoid judging yourself. So here we need to take role, take accountability for our lives. We need to take accountability for our attitude towards others, and we need to make attitude adjustments if necessary. That means if you've got sin that you're practicing in your life, before you take this cup, you need to make things right with God. You need to repent of your sin, confess your sin. He already said, I'll forgive you. But it's our responsibility to repent and confess and forsake. Amen? 
Confess, repent, forsake. That's the way of God. Hallelujah. So we're going to take a moment and pray right now. You may be here this morning. You're a guest. You've never maybe worshiped with us before. Or maybe you're here and you say, well, I got some things ain't right with God. And I ain't ready to make them right. Then abstain from this next part. Why? Because I hate to see you judge yourself like that. I'd rather see you judge yourself by saying some things aren't right with God. And I'm making those adjustments now. Forgive me, Father. Lord Jesus, empower me to live a life that honors you, not dishonors you. Let me represent you to the world, not falsely represent you to the world. Amen? And I always give that warning. Why? Because he said, for this reason, many of you are weak, chronic illness, and even death. That's how serious the blood of Jesus is. And it's even for eternity. Amen? So let's pray right now. If you need to make things right with God, please do so. Father, we just stand before you right now knowing the stakes. We understand that your blood is not to be toyed with. We understand that your blood is to be honored and not dishonored. We understand that we have to take accountability for the wrong we've done. Not only ourselves, but the wrong we've done to others. Lord, you told us that if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. And so today, we confess our sin. And if you need to confess, do it right now between you and Jesus. I can't do it for you. I can lead you in a prayer, but I cannot confess your sin. You have to do that yourself. So just make that peace with God right now in your heart. And Lord, we do confess our sins. We ask for forgiveness of those sins. Lord, we do make attitude adjustments toward you. We do honor you today. And as we've sang these beautiful choruses about the power of your blood, today we stand on that power and we thank you for it. And we confess, Jesus, you're our Lord. And we'll serve you with everything we got. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen Amen. and amen. Well, now that we've got that right, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so we take this broken piece of bread And we remember the stripes that were put on his back that we might be healed. And in the same manner, we take the cup and we recognize that this is symbolic of his blood and that when we drink this cup, we are in a blood covenant with God. And that blood covenant means He spilled his blood that we might live, and if necessary, we will spill our blood to live for him. Amen. We thank you, Jesus, for your awesome sacrifice. Amen and amen. If you wouldn't mind, turn off any ringers on any phones. We want to get into the word. We want to honor the word. And I've We've set a culture in this house. I ask you, do not be on Facebook. Do not be on social media unless you're sharing this link with someone else while I'm preaching. Because if you won't honor the word of God, then you're wrong. I don't know about you here. I'm here to be saved. Amen. I'm here to honor God. I'm not here to play games. And so we're very serious about the word of God in this church. And if you're not willing to be serious with us, then you might want to find another church. If you see your neighbor on Facebook, just tap them and say, you know, you really ought to turn that off. You really ought to turn that off. If you ain't got enough time in the week to be on Facebook, you got to be on it in church. Are you even here? Amen. I've had people say, I've never heard a pastor talk like that before. Well, you've heard a lot of Peter Pan pastors. And you know what Peter Pan does? He takes you to never, never land where you never grow up. 
You'll never prophesy. You'll never cast out a devil. You'll never heal the sick. You'll never raise the dead. That's what Peter Pan Pastor does. Amen? I don't want to be a church of little people that never grew up. This isn't the, the munchkins. This ain't the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. Oompa Loompas. This ain't the little midgets of the Wizard of Oz. Amen? We're supposed to be mighty warriors of Christ, dressed for battle. Amen? And that's what we're going to talk about today, being dressed for battle. This is... Uh, a series we've been doing on demons and deliverance, you know, what happens? We've, we've cast out a lot of devils in this church in the last month. We've seen some people come to new levels of freedom in their life. We've had some incredible testimonies of people whose lives have been changed. But as we've already discussed, just because you tell the devil to leave don't mean he's not coming back to try to get back in. Amen. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk a little bit about the battle. And then at the end of this service, I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to fight. Turn around your neighbor and say, we're going to fight. But not you. The devil. And I'm going to teach you how to fight the devil. He's a bully. I said the devil's a bully. You want to see a picture of Satan on earth, look at Putin right now. He'll send an artillery shell into an apartment complex. He's evil. He's the epitome of evil. He's Satan possessed. He is all he cares about is his own power. He has no value of human life. That's Satan. Amen. He's a bully. He's the king of bullies. Amen. The king of bullies. You know, um, I always like to go back when I think about things, and I, I've learned that, you know, many, many linguists have come to a conclusion that the earliest language they have of mankind was Hebrew. It was the first language. And all ancient languages have pictures. You've seen pictures of hieroglyphics, and, and you've seen uh, the different writings on cave walls where there's a picture of a, a man with a bow and an arrow and an antelope or a, whether it's an alien or an antelope. There's pictures all over the world that go back thousands of years. The pictures was a language. And Hebrew is one of those languages that has a picture for every word. And so I went back to the ancient Hebrew dictionary and I looked up the word strong. I looked up the word strong. How many of y'all want to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Is there anybody here who'd like to be weak in the Lord? Is there anybody here that doesn't want to be the best version of you? You know what the best version of you is? It's the one that's been set free by Jesus. And, and you've come forth in such power that you're bold as a lion. That's the best version of you. Amen? God, God, Jesus died to bring forth the best version of you, which, to be honest, he couldn't even fix the old you. He had to make a new you. Because the old you was pretty messed up. Amen? So the artist started with a clean canvas and he gave you a new heart to work with. Amen? And he's been building on that ever since. But as I looked up the word strong in the ancient Hebrew, there was a picture of a warrior with a sword. And it said, this was the definition of the word. Quick to use your weapon. So the mindset of God in original language was when he said you're strong, it means you're the one that's ready for battle. You're the one that's quick to draw your sword. You're the one that's ready to take it to the enemy. And then I, I, I looked up to make strong. How do you make someone strong? I was a little surprised at the, at the picture. To make strong or to cause someone to become strong, the ancient Hebrew word picture was a wall that a man had broken through with a hammer and saw what was on the other side. Amen. Now, here was the definition as it was written. It is the picture of breaking through a wall and what happens when you see through the wall. 
you will be strong to break through into what you have seen. And the first part of that was what follows the vision. See, when you see you can be free, and you get that first glimpse of the light of hope, when you can see through faith that next version of you, now power comes in, and you're going to get through that wall to make it happen. You know, when I was a very young Christian coming out of 12 years of addiction, coming out of a horrible lifestyle, it was hard to see myself as an overcomer. It was hard to see myself as a holy man because I had been an unholy man. It was hard to see myself as a victorious warrior because I was at the mercy and in the chains of addiction. I couldn't see living without it. And then I heard testimonies. Everybody say, my testimony. I heard testimonies of people that said, I was like this, and now I'm like this. And that was what, what you see. That was what follows the vision. When I got a vision, because I grew up in a church that had no power. I grew up in formalism and tradition. The church I grew up in, the deacons were on the side porch, hot and cigarettes, you know. The church I grew up in was powerless. It was form, pomp, and ceremony. But I never seen anybody look the devil in the eye and say, come out. I never seen anybody say, we're going to fight this cancer with the blood of Jesus. I never saw warriors in church. I saw Nice people. Everybody turn around and say, nice people. I saw so many nice people. But then when they left the church parking lot, they became like other people. Not so nice. I didn't see strong warriors in Christ. I saw actors. So the church begins to take on a reputation hypocrites why would they call you be a hypocrite because you act in church different than you act outside the word hypocrite means actor and some people say our oh, church is full of hypocrites and it was and there's still two or three around this morning here and we know who you are <laughs> actually we don't but the devil does I really don't know who you are, but he does. And he'll beat the snot out of you the minute you get out of that door if you let him. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I was so little. And uh, as I got into grade school, I got into about the first and second grade. And there was a certain boy in my class. And I don't know what it was. I know what it was now. There was a call of God on my life. And Satan knew it. And there was another boy in my class, and he came from a very rough, rough, rough family. Alcoholic parents, I mean, bad news. They, they were bad news bears right there in the neighborhood. And I came from a nice family. Went to church on Sundays. And this boy, for some reason, he had it out for me. He was a few inches taller than me, a few pounds heavier. And this kid became my personal demon for about three or four years. And I remember sitting in school in second, third, fourth grade, and this boy would send a note to me, and he'd say, I'm going to kick your blank after school. And I would get sick at my stomach, and fear would grip me. It's just a little boy. And I knew I had to walk out to that bus stop, and I knew it would be about 10 minutes and then I knew I had to get off the bus stop, and I knew he'd get off at my bus stop so he could pummel me. And this kid beat me up I don't know how many times. And he'd usually knock my books out, punch me in the gut, throw me down, laugh at me, and walk away. And he did this for a few years. 
And then one day, there was a bunch of us boys in the neighborhood. And we were all playing in the front yard. And there was probably six, eight of us. And all of a sudden, we said, let's do big time wrestling, you know. And so we were going to wrestle. And so we paired off and began to wrestle. And as we wrestled, all of a sudden, I look around and there's that boy and it's me and him's turn. And fear gripped me. And so we went at it and about 15 seconds, he was on the ground pinned. And I'll never forget this, Greg, as long as I live. I looked in his eyes and I knew and he knew. I'll whip your butt, boy. I knew I could take him in a minute. Fear had kept me from even fighting. Fear had kept me from even fighting. Fear is a powerful enemy. Fear is a powerful enemy. And can I tell you, we became best friends after that, and he never threatened me again because I knew and he knew. Say it with me. Say, I know and he knows. Now, the devil knows right now whether you're real or fake. He knows whether you can back up your threat. He knows whether you mean what you say or not. You know, a lot of times I tried to quit doing things, tried to quit smoking, tried to quit doing drugs, tried to quit drinking. Couldn't do it. Why? Because I knew and he knew. He looked me in the eye and said, it ain't in you, Chisholm. It ain't in you. And he knew it wasn't in me and I knew it wasn't in me. And even though I had a want to, like Paul talks about in Romans 7, I had a want to, but I couldn't do it. And then one day, we wrestled. Except this time, I had been to the Jesus gym. And I had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'd gotten born again. And I had gotten empowered with the power from on high. And this time... I looked the devil in the eye, and he knew, and I knew, the game's already over. Because I've seen you're a freaking bully, and the only thing that has held me captive is I was afraid to fight. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 this morning. There's no truce with evil. Amen. Say that with me. There is no truce with evil. Anytime you try to take the attitude, devil, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. You just got invaded. He'll look at you and say, oh, I'll do that while he ravages your life. Just like Ukraine. You know, they've had two peace talks. <laughs> two peace talks, and that didn't work out so well. It didn't work out so well. Why? Putin's a bully. He's the perfect picture of the devil. What's happening in Ukraine is the perfect picture of what happens to a Christian when they're not empowered with the power and the Holy Ghost of God. That's why Jesus told his disciples, don't you leave here until you're empowered. Don't you leave here until the Holy Ghost comes on you. Don't you leave here until you're ready for the battle. And these men that were hiding in fear, these men that were cowering, these men that didn't even have enough strength to stand with Jesus on the night he was crucified, they hid in that upper room and they waited and they ring. I'm sure they were ringing their fingers and their knees were knocking. And every time there was a tap on the door, they're like, oh, oh. And then one day, suddenly, suddenly, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. 
suddenly there was a tongue of fire that came and sat upon each of them. Suddenly, they began to stand up and begin to say, what have we been afraid of? What have we been afraid of? He has conquered death, hell, and the grave. What are we afraid of? Because the power of God filled them. And then they walked out on the street. And the Romans said, we'll arrest you. They said, go for it. They said, we'll kill you. They said, do us a favor. And these men that hidden coward were empowered with the power from on high. And nothing could stop them. Nothing could stop them. See, we come here today, we're allowed to. They met when they weren't allowed to. We assemble where it's legal. They assembled when it was illegal. We preach the name of Jesus without fear of persecution. They preached the word of Jesus knowing they'd face the sword and execution. Now, days are changing today. Days are changing. And we've got to be ready, and we've got to be filled. You know, we've been casting a lot of stuff out. We've got to fill this temple back up. We've got to change our mindset. We've got to become victorious instead of victims. We've got to be empowered and emboldened instead of fearful and afraid. It's time to fulfill the scripture The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. We're in a war. You're in a war for your children. You're in a war for your family. You're in a war for your job. You're in a war for everything today. We're in a war for our moral values as a nation. Half this nation celebrates taking a woman with a fully developed baby in her belly, putting an anesthesia in that woman, shoving a pair of scissors through her cervix and chopping a baby to pieces and sucking it out with a vacuum cleaner and selling it to a makeup company. And they call that a woman's right to choose. Why don't we call it what it really is? A woman's right to commit murder without consequence, or so we think. What God calls perversion, we've called normal. We're in a war for our values. We're in a war. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now, please listen, for I need to address an issue. I'm making this personal appeal to you by the gentleness and self-forgetfulness of Christ. I'm the one who is humble and timid when face-to-face with you, but bold and outspoken when a safe distance away. Now, I plead with you that when I come, uh, don't force me to take a hard line with you, which I'm willing to do, By daring to confront those who mistakenly believe we're living by the standards of the world and not by the Spirit's wisdom and power. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, Our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses by which or from which people hide. In the King James says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Think about that. We don't fight flesh and blood, the scripture says. But we're fighting against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and the wicked spirits 
that reign in this present culture. People's ideals. We're fighting a spiritual battle, and we've got to be dressed for battle. Amen. We've got to be prepared for war. He says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God. This is where, you know, there are a lot of Christians who have never really gotten victory over the actions they do. And we're going to help you get victory over that. That's the sinful pleasures and the things you do. We confront that all the time. But there's another level of this. God wants you free in your mind. The Bible talks about, I know the thoughts of the wicked. That's what God said. I know your thoughts. See, God's level of warfare goes beyond just what you do. It begins in what you think. In the fantasies of your mind. I don't know about you, but... I literally, this bully I was talking about, I remember I had fantasies of beating him up. And there was this part of me that said, just roundhouse him, sucker punch him, do whatever you got to do, kick him in the groin, beat this kid, stop letting this kid pick on you. But that fantasy was only a fantasy. And I would fantasize it, but it was never real. But God doesn't even want you yielding your thought life to unclean things. God wants your thought life to be as pure as white as snow. And we can attain that. We can attain that. How? How can we attain that? We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. Now, I like the way that I'm reading from the Passion Translation this morning. I like, I like a lot of translations on this thing, you know? But I like what it says here next. You know, we capture like prisoners of war Every thought and insist, it bows to Jesus. Now, I want you to close your eyes with me for a moment. And I want you to picture this. In your heart and in your mind, I want you to picture. This is what happens when I start to think something that God calls sin. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to see yourself dressed as a mighty warrior, walking into your own brain, taking that thought, binding it with chains, and telling it to bow and submit to the word of God. I want you to see yourself doing that. I want you to see yourself doing that. And then you say this with your mouth, no. In Jesus' name, I'm not going there. That thought comes. No! In Jesus' name, no! What would you do if you thought your life was really being threatened? We need some spiritual adrenaline. We need a spiritual fight response. I tell you, I have just, I have so brought my mind into subjection, I will not let it think Amen. on something that God does not approve. I refuse to. Amen. I talk to myself every day. No. 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 I got out of my truck this morning at about 7 o'clock out here in the parking lot. And as I shut the truck door, I'm going to tell you what I did. I said, okay, mind, 
It's time to go into the presence of God. You hear me? It's time to think on the things of God now for what's going to happen this morning in this service. I had to take every thought captive. I had to bring every thought into submission. And I have to live like that daily as you do. And as we do this, I mean, through the wonder of technology, they have now proven so many things that the Bible has been telling us for thousands of years, but now they've proven it through imagery. Imagery, M-R-I, brain mapping. They have proven everything God says just about, about our mind now under a microscope, scientifically. As I begin to study the human mind and how it works in the brain, it is amazing to me. But here's one of the, there's so many beautiful parts about how we're, you know, the scripture says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that there's only one part of your brain that never gets too old to change? How many of y'all heard the saying, can't teach an old dog new tricks? And you know there's a complete science for that? But God left one part of the brain and gives us one part of the brain that controls the limbic system. It's the front right cortex. And some psychologists call it the joy center of the brain. And that part of your brain can redevelop even when you're as old as Gary Nangle. <laughs> At 80, it can redevelop. At 62, it, at least for another week, it can <laughs> still redevelop. God has formed us and fashioned us. But then we get into the study of what's called epigenetics. And I, I knew, man, I knew 40 years ago when I was hearing all this teaching about generational curses and you got to cast out this demon. I kept saying there's more to it than just a demon. I don't understand it, but I know when the Bible says the sins of the fathers will be passed to the children three unto four generations, I know there's more to it. It ain't just a demon. I wish it was. We could fix everybody. But those propensities for certain sins are genetically passed on. And now through this wonderful science, they have a new science called epigenetics. It means over the gene. And here's what they've learned. While propensities, for example, alcoholism, They've never found the part of the DNA that says alcoholism or homosexuality or any sin, adulterer, liar, thief. They've never found that. But what they have discovered are propensities towards things. And it started with mice in a laboratory. They took some little mice and they hooked up little electrodes to them. And they injected a smell, an odor, into their cage. And as soon as the mouse smelled it, they shocked them. And so any time the smell would be introduced, the mouse would wince because it knew it was about to get shocked. Well, then they took the mouse's pups, the babies, and they were born and they introduced the smell into the cage, and guess what? The newborn pups winced without ever being shocked. Then they went to the third generation and even the fourth generation, and they found that propensity to fear that smell was passed genetically down to four generations. Now, we take human beings, and we find that, oh, but here's the beautiful part of it. They learned that through the way 
our brains work, that can be reversed. That's the good news. <laughs> Bad news is, I got my grandpa's temper. Good news is, you don't got to keep it. And you don't got to pass it on to your kid. It can be reversed by repetitious positive reinforcement. So they could take that pup and as soon as he smelled the smell, offer him a reward. And guess what? Within a short time, the pup no longer reacted to the bad odor with fear. God designed us to where we can recover. God designed us to where we can fight back and take back every weakness. We can take back every bad attitude, everything that the enemy thinks he's got us in. God can take it back, and we can take it back. And I told you that because what I'm doing now is I'm breaking through a wall called deception that says you can never change. You can never do that. That wall says you're stuck here. You'll never overcome. You'll never be free. And I'm busting a hole through it. And when you see through the other side and you peek and you see that light of freedom and you see someone else that was just like you and now they're free, you'll start swinging that hammer with a new strength You'll start swinging that hammer with a new power. You'll go, if you need to, rent a D9 bulldozer. And you're coming through, man. I'm getting through the wall. And you know, I started thinking about my testimony. You know what helped me so much? You know I tell a lot of stories. Why? Because when I was so messed up, and I heard men of God saying, I was that messed up. And now I'm not. It was like punching a hole through the wall and saying, if he did it for you. And I remember saying after meetings, if he did it for him, he'll do it for me. Because they taught me God's no respecter of persons. And he's the same God to all through all. He never changes. So if he set me free, he'll set you free. If he gave me power, he'll give you power. If he made me victorious, he can make you victorious. But sometimes you just got to have someone help you bust through the wall and get that fight inside you. Man, I've yelled at the devil so many times. You say, was he hard of hearing? I think so. Based upon reaction. I think he is hard of hearing. Sometimes, you know, the word cast out a demon, that word cast in the Greek means to drive it out with a force. There's a difference between a parent looking at a little brat kid. Everybody say, I'm a, okay, I'm going to give you the definition of a spoiled brat. You ready? Someone else's five-year-old. Right? <laughs> There's a difference, you know. I was at my daughter's house a couple of weeks ago, and uh, little Miles, you know, <laughs> he's ornery. He's in that age, you know. He's a three-nager. <laughs> Amen? And uh, little Miles was doing something, and you know, I was like, stop it, Miles. And all of a sudden, she goes, Mr. And he's... <laughs> See... Miles knows when she's playing. Miles knows she don't mean it. Now, I'm seeing some kids here this morning. You know when they mean it. How many of y'all knew when mom meant it and you knew when dad meant it? And game over. Right? I mean, I, I, I mean, game over. It's done. My wife, with my children, when her shoe came off, <laughs> hide, run for cover, mom's about to 
chuck a shoe and she wore clogs, man, back then. I seen her wing a clog at Janelle one day and she ducked and it put a hole in the drywall, man. I mean, <laughs> she will hurt you. They knew when I remember I was a little boy. My mom is this, you know, very phlegmatic personality, just the nicest lady you ever saw. And I remember I was about five years old, and she had this friend named Ruth, and it was one of them love-hate relationships. And I'll never forget, she got word that Ruth had been trashing my sister Karen in the neighborhood. And we're all sitting in the living room and they're playing cards, you know. And, and all of a sudden, I turn around and my mom has got Karen's baton over this woman. You shut your mouth. <laughs> I promise you, that gossip stopped right there. I still talk about that. Mom, I remember the night you went after Ruth Malone with a baton. <laughs> She'll say, Oh, David. I said, you did. I was there. It's one of the few memories I have as a child. I was traumatized. That woman, go mom. <laughs> Whoo. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you. I'm, I'm here to wake up the warrior inside you this morning. I'm telling you, you got to look the devil in the eye. And you got to know the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a name above every name. Think about it. Those 70 men he sent out into Judea. He sent them out. And they came back. He sent them out two by two. And here was the rehearsal of the story when they returned. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The, the people of Israel said, what new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands the unclean spirits and they obey. Mama. my. my. It's time to command some unclean spirits that like to try to hang around and seduce you into sin. Behind every unholy trait, you will find demon power. Amen. And one thing demons do, they amplify, they magnify the desires of the soul and the flesh. They take something normal and they make it seductive. And a lot of times, ladies, let me just say this, and you're going to hate me for this, you're going to be mad at me for this, but I don't care. The demons dress you in the morning sometimes. And you say, and, and, and women, here's their answer. Well, men shouldn't be lusting. Well, if you dress yourself up like a popsicle, don't be... Surprised when a little boy on a hot summer day wants to follow you around. Okay, men, same thing. Same thing. The Bible talks about being conservative and modest, even with your apparel. Why? I don't want to be in partnership with a spirit of lust. I remember down the street one day, this woman come up to me, and she was madder than a hornet, man. I'll never forget this morning, Sunday morning. She come up to me, and she said, Pastor Dave, your usher was looking at my breasts. And I looked, and I said, if you'd cover them puppies up, maybe he wouldn't be looking at them. You come with the flagship hanging out. My gosh. Okay, I'm off that. <laughs> and you women are still mad at the men for looking. You know, there's only one reason we put up a billboard. Because we want to be red. All right. 
four families just left. <laughs> Why? Because you know she's in charge. <laughs> last, last decision he made when he said hi 22 years ago. Anyway, I'm off that. <laughs> Thank you. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Okay. Oh, I could go a long way on this one, but I'm not. <laughs> Gary's looking at me. Nicole. She <laughs> Nicole's usually giving me one of these, one of these. I just got a dirty look right now. I don't know what that means. <laughs> She's like, hey, you're on your own, man. <laughs> There's no me and team. Anyway, moving right along. All right. Since we're armed, look at verse 6, with such dynamic weaponry. We stand ready. He's always around. I promise you, demons, either they're in this room or they're waiting in your car. I may have torqued them off. Some of them already left. But they're ready. They're ready. They're riding on your phone. Click on that. You hear this little click on that. You think it was just you. And believe me, there's enough evil in you to go around. But the devil likes to amplify, magnify, multiply. The devil likes to give you good little ideas. But when you look him in the eye, and he knows... And you know, it's over. Amen. It's over. Since we're armed with such dynamic weaponry, is your weaponry dynamic? Or are you like one of them little Peter Pan Christians in the land where boys never grow up to be men and girls never grow up to be women of God? We're ready to stand and punish any trace of rebellion. A lot of people want to point out everybody else's problems. But they forgot to look in the mirror Amen. as soon as your obedience is fulfilled. See, I don't even, you know, it's like, okay... Worst thing I can do is go point out someone else's problems when I got the same problem. Amen. Bible says the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. And I have a principle that I've tried to live for the last 37 years preaching this gospel. And that is, I won't preach something I can't live. Amen. Because I want to prove it. I want to prove it in the word, and I want to prove it in the practice I want to prove it's possible. And of course, that isn't even fullness because I shouldn't ever limit God based upon my own poor performance. Even if I don't overcome, that doesn't mean it can't be overcame. It just simply means I have not yet fully taken God's power and utilized it in a worthy manner that I'm free. Because I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes there's those areas of the pleasures of sin we don't really want to be free of. And there's not much we can do with that except keep praying. That's called rebellion. That's called stubbornness. And in the Bible, it's called idolatry and witchcraft. We read that last week. Come on up, guys.
Here's what we're going to do now. We've been talking. You know, we can sit and talk about fighting all day long. But we're going to fight now. Turn at your neighbor and say, we're going to fight now. We're going to get aggressive. We're going to get aggressive. We're going to get aggressive. With what? Thoughts and ways. For some of you, I love you as your pastor, and I'm only saying this because it's a battle I fight every day in my own life. If you don't get control of your diet, you're going to die prematurely. Sorry. If you don't get control of your eating habits, you're going to die prematurely. And you're not going to have a great death. And I say that as one who has to crucify my appetite every single day because I usually want to eat everything you do and twice as much. Some of you, the fantasies, you've given yourself permission not to actually do it, but to fantasize about it. Things like porn. Come on. Some of you, you got that victim mentality. Everybody owes you something. No, they don't. Jesus paid you in full. He gave you salvation. Now you quit being a victim and you rise up and become victorious in Christ. Some of you, you can't let go of the past. I thank God for the day I could say the past is past at last. And I stepped into the fullness of I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to Christ Jesus and given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in the world reconciling the world to himself and given me. Now, I am now an ambassador of a foreign kingdom declaring the king's will in a foreign land. I'm declaring the king's will in a foreign, a foreign land. The kingdom of the earth has not yet fully been made the kingdom of Christ, but it will happen in that day. Because the scripture says, and then there will be a proclamation, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of God. And that's when the devil's locked up, but he ain't locked up yet. He's still going about, and it says, Your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Are you cat food this morning? Are you cat food? Man, I don't want to be cat food for the devil. I need a warning song. Can we do our lion song? This is a song they wrote with Jason. And we're going to fight for a few minutes here. If there's fight in you, I want you to fight. You say, well, Dave, I'm, I'm doing all right. I don't really have a... Okay, then fight for your children. Fight for your loved ones. Fight for your neighbor. Fight for the one who really right now doesn't have much fight in them. If you're going to get dressed for battle, you're going to fight. Amen? Now let's stand together. First of all, we're going to sing this. Now here's what I want you to do. If you're in a battle right now, I don't care if you're fighting depression, obsession. I don't care if you're fighting anxiety. I don't care if you're fighting lust or fear or greed. I don't care if you're fighting not being able to tell the truth. You got a lying spirit. I don't care if you're just fighting a discouraging moment. Maybe you're just in the heat of battle and you just need some brothers and sisters to reinforce you. 
If that's you this morning, I want you to just come down front here and we're going to fight together for a few minutes. Just make your way down here. Come on. Come on, let's war. Come on, let's war. Let me hear your war cry. Let me hear your war cry. You're up in the balcony and you're fighting a good fight. Get on down here and let's fight. You're either going to be a wimp or you're going to be a warrior. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to lay hold of eternal life. There ain't no demon going to steal my destiny. And there ain't no habit that is going to keep me from obeying my God. Because I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight. How about you? I said, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight. I'm in a war. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight. I'm not surrendering anymore. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to take the fight to the enemy. Come on. I'm ready to take the fight to the enemy.
begin to pray and I want you to get aggressive. I want you to get aggressive. I want you to look the enemy in the eye and I want you to say it's over. No more. I'm not your toy. I'm not your toy. And you're not toying with me anymore. It's over. I stand in the blood of Christ. I stand by the righteousness of the Son of God. I submit myself to God. I resist you devil. And you gotta go. You gotta go. You gotta go. Now begin to lift up your voice. Say it. You gotta go. You get out. You get out. Get out devil. That's it. Get out. Begin to name the demon your fight. Begin to name the attitude. Laziness. Laziness. You'll not steal my prosperity. Name it. Unforgiveness. You'll not take my blessing. Name it. Lust. You'll not bind me anymore. Fear. I will not submit to you. Anxiety, you're a name that is below the name of Jesus. Depression, I'll wear you no more. 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 You no more. Rejection, no, it's over. I'm accepted in Christ. Rejection, it's over. I'm accepted in Christ. You name it. You know what you're fighting. You know what you're fighting. Anger. Anger, rage. Anger and rage. Uncontrolled temper. No, it's over. It's over. You got to get aggressive. You got to fight. You've been given weapons of warfare. You've been given power over every demonic power. You've been given the Holy Ghost. You've been given the Holy Ghost. He's more powerful than any power. He's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Come on, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Prophesy. Prophesy. It's over, devil. Prophesy. I'm not yielding to you anymore. Prophesy. Speak it forth. God's given you His Word. God's given you His Word to use like a sword. God's given you His Word to use like a sword. Come on, swing that sword, young men. Swing that sword, young women. Swing that sword of the Spirit. Speak the word to the devil. It is written, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. It is written, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on. Come on. Come on. Fight. Fight. Fight! Fight! Fight!
fight, 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 fight. Yeah! and tries to compromise our position we will stand and having done all withstand we'll fight the fight we'll fight the fight with all our might we'll stand and we'll be ready for war we'll walk fully dressed for battle we'll walk with the helmet of salvation. We'll keep Christ in our thoughts. We will not yield to vain images in our mind. We will not yield to lustful images in our mind. We will fight. We will have our feet protected because we will prepare and we will study and we will know the word of God. Our feet will be protected with the gospel of peace. We will gird about our loins with the belt of truth. We will speak truth to every lie. We will speak truth to every lie. We'll take the breastplate of righteousness and we'll not listen to any spirit of condemnation, guilt, or shame. But we will stand our ground in our position with God. We will take the shield of faith. Wherewith we will quench every flaming missile of the enemy. And we will wield the sword of the spirit which is the word of Almighty God. A word that will never change. A word that will be fulfilled. We will stand ready for battle every week, every day, every minute, every hour. When he comes and sudden fear tries to come upon us, sudden terror tries to tell us we're not gonna make it, sudden terror tries to tell us we're going to fall. We will answer aggressively with the truth of the word. It is written. I will worship God and serve him only. It is written. I will resist you, Satan, and you must flee 
it is written he will give me power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm me it is written and we stand armed and dangerous to the kingdom of darkness we stand armed and dangerous to the kingdom of darkness and we prepare ourselves for the battles of this week we prepare ourselves for the battles of this week we look into the future and we know that our future is secure. We look to the end and we know we win. We break through the wall and we receive new strength from God. And our strength is made stronger. Our attitude is recovered. And we will walk, we will walk in the power of God and his might and when our obedience is fulfilled we will be ready to then go after the disobedience There's a great man of God, and I only heard stories about him. I got to meet his wife, but he had already gone to heaven when I came into the kingdom. His name's Gordon Lindsay. He founded that great missionary prep school in Dallas called Christ for the Nations. And Gordon Lindsay had a book that I still read it from time to time. And I, I'll never forget something he said. He said, I fully believe that every believer needs to pray at least one aggressive warrior prayer every day. Sometimes you just got to tell the devil you're not welcome here. He'll go where allowed. He'll go where he's allowed. If you let him in, he'll come in. He will assume permission. You know, you drive around sometimes and you see signs up, no trespassing. Beware of the dog. One bumper sticker says, don't worry about the dog. Beware of the owner. And shows a picture of a gun. Amen. We need to walk with that same attitude towards the kingdom of darkness. No trespassing. Beware of the owner. Because I will send Jesus to the door when you knock. I will send Jesus to the door when you knock. Let me see your mic a second. Hallelujah. You know, about 10 years ago, I uh, went back to school to be a counselor in a secular system that is way messed up. But as over the last 10 years, as I've been working with people who are not in the church, they, but they believe they're Christians. They really do believe that they believe in God and they trust God. But the spirit that I keep seeing in almost everybody is the spirit of compromise. And one of the things that I am really like focused on right now is the fact that the parents aren't teaching the kids how to fight compromise. They're allowing things because, oh, that looks good. That looks good for the people in the schools or whatever. But they're not fighting. They're not teaching the kids in the home how to fight the spirit of compromise. Because it's easy, trust me, it's easy, even as a believer, to go into the secular system 
and then find yourself feeling like you're compromising God because the system is a compromise of God. And you have to come, you have to be able to become the light in the system. They are in the schools every day in a secular system that says, you need to say, my homosexuality is okay. My depravity is okay. Like, I just found out not too long ago, they're actually going to make a diagnosis for pedophilia. Like, they're going to say, oh, that's normal. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just do some therapy and that'll go away. But if we don't teach our kids how to come against every spirit that the enemy has placed in their path, they are going to walk in the compromise because it's more familiar to them than in their house where they should be able to be taught how to fight every spirit that's coming against God and their identity. They will move in a spirit of compromise if you don't in your home say, this is unacceptable and this is why. It's not saying you don't love the person in it. That's kind of where I got into it. It's like, oh my gosh. Like, how do you reach somebody who is in a lifestyle of homosexuality, trying to show them love, but yet tell them their lifestyle is wrong? That's tricky whenever you're in a secular system, like I am at work. And I do. I repent because I feel like I've compromised a lot in that setting. No more. No more. They bring God into it, and buddy, I'm going to be on that like white on rice. Come on. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it's not them that God doesn't like. It's the sin, and only the sin, that God yeah. does not like. They have the potential to have the same identity that we do. Yeah. They have to turn from it. How yeah. are we ever going to reach them if we say, oh, that's okay. We'll pet that little thing for a little while. Say, you're okay. You don't have to change. Compromise. It is huge in our culture. And if this culture in this house is going to change anything out there, anything out there, we have got to be standing on that truth if we can't compromise either. Amen. We can't compromise. You've got to be bold. Being bold as the lion, right? Amen. It's what we've declared this morning, and I'm sitting back around like, oh God. Compromise. Making things easy for people because we think it's going to be difficult to confront it. Confrontation is not pretty. Amen. Confront even of ourselves, it's not pretty. Amen. Compromise. Yeah. We gotta nail it to the Come cross. On. Come on. Amen. 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 Let's just hit that right now. Let's just hit that right now. Let's just hit that right now. In the name of Jesus. Father, for any compromise that's in our lives, what we've done to please man instead of God, where we have just not wanted to speak the truth because it will make us unpopular, where we have not wanted to speak the truth because we don't want people not to accept us or not to like us or not to improve of, uh, approve of us. Lord, we stand against that spirit of compromise. That is an attitude that we must address in our own hearts and minds and lives. Lord, we will stand for truth and righteousness even if it costs us our head. You were crucified because you wouldn't compromise. John the Baptist was beheaded because he would not compromise. Peter was crucified upside down because he wouldn't compromise. Paul was beheaded because he wouldn't compromise. Thomas was thrust through with a spear because he wouldn't compromise. Lord, we have all these examples written for us that we might know how to live a powerful bold life in you and so we just confess the sin of compromise right now in Jesus name 
right now. And you know, compromise is not, so to speak, a demon. It's a fruit of a seducing spirit. It seduces you to make those soft stands so that you may be glorified. Because nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody wants to be disliked or ridiculed or looked at or made fun of. Nobody wants that. And so that self-love, that compromise will seduce us, protect yourself. You don't really need to say that. Okay, let someone continue to be a lie and then their blood's on your hands before the judgment of Christ. Then their blood is on your hands. I want to thank you for staying with me and fighting this morning. Amen. I want to thank you for staying with me and fighting. This is a church built for warriors. I wish I could say this church is for everyone, but unfortunately not everybody's ready to fight yet. But this is a church designed for those who are ready to fight. Amen. We are leading a military campaign against darkness. We're not here to just say, well, darkness is here and there's really nothing we can do about it. No, we're here to invade the darkness. Amen. We're here to invade the darkness. You know when the scripture says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? Michael Heisler brought out the actual original language of that. And you know what that really means? It doesn't mean that the gates of hell are in a sense of offense against the church. It means they can't stop us. They can't stop us. The gates of hell can't stop us. Nothing can stop us when we're in the name of Jesus and we're in his purpose and pursuit. Amen? Amen. Well, our prayer team's gonna hang out up here a little bit. If there's anybody needs more prayer before you leave, just come on up and get more prayer, man. We're here to fight with you. We love you and bless you. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Amen.